Greetings, and welcome back. I thought it might be interesting on occasion to occasionally intersperse the historical content with more uh, contemporary issues, if you will, but still issues germane to language and linguistics. Contemporary isn't really the right word, but issues that are related to language and linguistics, but um, may in fact deviate from the specific narrative that I've embarked on, which for the moment is the history of the English language. So today we're going to be looking at uh, prescriptivism versus descriptivism. Now the first question you might have is, what is prescriptivism and what is descriptivism? Well, if you recall your childhood uh, in school, whatever your native tongue might be, you might remember learning certain rules in, uh, in school for how to speak and how to write. And these are what we call prescriptive rules. They are the rules that are literally prescribed to you. But in linguistics, linguists use the term descriptivism. They are, most linguists are descriptivists as opposed to prescriptivists. Uh, descriptivism or the descriptive approach or model is simply uh, the model of how language actually is used and actually is spoken. And this is true for every language that has a written standard or a formal spoken standard versus uh, other variants. And these often come into conflict. Uh, prescriptivists certainly come into conflict with descriptivists. Now, I myself, of course, have to be a descriptivist because, well, I like, I'm scientifically literate and I like to consider myself uh, someone who adheres to scientific principles. And uh, there's simply no evidence to suggest uh, any truth whatsoever to a prescriptive approach. However, there's no denying that a prescriptive model has its utility. Now, let's first understand the origins of prescriptivism versus de descriptivism as a, as a model for language. Now, it actually goes way, way, way back. Uh, you can see prescriptive models offered in antiquity. But the real coming of age uh, for the prescriptivist uh, model or the prescriptive model is uh, probably the 18th century uh, and the 19th century because this was the time when the emergence of the nation state and massive consolidation of uh, socioeconomic power were centered around certain areas in certain countries. So first off, we have to understand what, how a language standard comes about to begin with. A language standard, that is a standard that the majority of people adhere to, at least technically speaking, this has nothing to do with the standard itself being superior or inferior or anything else. Usually this has to do with uh, the socioeconomic status of the speakers of said standard. Uh, with, and this socioeconomic status is then associated with a particular location. So if you look at the history of English, uh, during most of the uh, Old English period, particularly the late Old English period, the socio-economic concentration of power, the hegemonic uh, focal point of power, was Wessex, which is in the southwest of, of England. And when the Norman conquest uh, occurred, and, after, and certainly afterwards, there was a reconcentration of power towards the southeast, specifically towards London. And as you see, this has nothing to do with uh, the linguistic status of the language, but with a shift in hegemonic power. The same is true, of course, uh, in, in France. Uh, for a long time during the Middle Ages, uh, despite Paris being important, the southern uh, varieties of French and the languages such as Provençal that are not properly French, but rather some kind of mixture between Italian and French, for lack of a better description, were wildly popular uh, in, in the use of poetry, for example. I'm sure you've heard of the troubadours. And much of that, of course, was the basis for um, uh, Dante and his, uh, his writing of the uh, Divine Comedy. 
But in the 17th and 18th centuries, uh, as uh, France became a, a powerful uh, colonial uh, nation, if you will, um, with a consolidation of the crown very much centered in Paris, this brought about the slow and sometimes rapid extirpation of other languages, as well as, in particular, competing variants of French. Uh, and this is also the time, uh, not coincidentally, that you see the emergence of l'Académie Française, which, uh, of course, is a, a prescriptive institute uh, that is uh, was designed in the 17th century to you know, per, uh, pursue linguistic purity and offer prescriptions for how French was to be spoken. Uh, and many countries have this have have had this uh, in the past, but. By and large, uh, none of these uh, prescriptive approaches have ever worked. Language changes, and language is, is and always shall be defined by its speakers. That said, there, as I said, there's an argument for the utility of having a certain standard, uh, a universal standard, if you will. But Noor, I just wanted to give a little, uh, I just wanted to give a little background as to how prescriptive standards come about. Uh, very often there's there's some tangible or sometimes intangible uh, connection between the emergence of the nation state and prescriptive standards. Now, as far as the nitty gritty details go, we can start by something fairly uh, with something uh, fairly simple. Uh, let's take something that many English speakers indulge in. I myself don't do this. I'm, I'm pretty prescriptive in my speech and writing, if only because I spent way too much time in academia. And uh, my back, I also have classical training in Greek and Latin, and I, I don't know, just that's the way it's worked with me. But many, many English speakers will use a phrase such as, me and him went to the cinema, me and him went to the movies. This is descriptively fine, but prescriptively, uh, people will, will balk at this. Prescriptivists don't like this. Uh, the reason for this, the reason for prescriptivists not liking this is because me and him are object pronouns. That is, uh, I, if you remember the last video when I talked about cases, they're not in the subject case. And according to prescriptivists, this uh, is not a possible sentence because it would have to be he and I went to the cinema or he and I went to the movies. But once again, this is not how language works, and people do, and they, they say, and they 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 do these kinds of things, and uh, if most people find this perfectly okay. Uh, I myself would not speak this way, but like I said, I've had prescriptivism, prescriptive appro approaches to language drummed and drilled into me for well over a decade, um, well, 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 well over 15 years, so it's difficult for me. But this is perfectly fine. So this is a small example of prescriptive versus descriptive approach, say, in English. Another uh, example of this, is, this is more recent, is particularly in American English, which is my native language, uh, is the, dis the lack of distinction in the so-called existential construction there is versus there are. Many, many Americans these days, even fairly educated ones, will simply make a statement such as there's there's lots of cars in the parking lot there's um, there's lots of people there's so you have this there's as opposed to there are now the qualm the issue that prescriptivists would have with this is that uh, this 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 construction lacks agreement and what do we mean by agreement is to say the copula which is a fancy term for the verb to be the conjugation doesn't agree with the number. That is, there are lots of cars, which would be the formal prescriptive approach versus the descriptive approach, there is lots of cars. Uh, but that's, once again, how people speak. And native speakers who use this construction clearly don't care very much about agreement because if they did, uh, they wouldn't be using it. And this isn't a really serious issue. Uh, French and its existential construction uh, or rather, there there is there are constructions uh, is uh, doesn't care. Il y a il y a des voitures. Il y a une voiture. Whether it's it's one or or several, 
it doesn't really matter. There are there is a car. There are uh, cars. French uses the same construction. So this this just doesn't matter to speakers. But prescriptivists uh, get upset because there's a lack of existential agreement, and the list goes on and on. Uh, one thing you'll see in written uh, internet discourse often is something, to, or even spoke, spoke, spoken much more often than written, but you'll see it written as, I could have did better, I could have went went to the store earlier, things like that, as opposed to I could have, I could have done better or I could have got, gone to the store. Uh, and once again, a prescriptivist issue with this would be that you're not using the past participle, you're using the, the simple past or the imperfect or the preterite and uh, you're also not using the right auxiliary verb some people literally write I've seen this in the internet uh, I could of as opposed to could have or could have could of went um, so but this is like I said many native speakers particularly of the, of the American variety will use this construction and it's fairly uh, common uh, another one that is considered prescriptively incorrect that's very common in UK English is he was sat he was sat someplace as opposed to he was sitting in some place. Very, very common in British English. He was he was sat at the counter. He was at something to that effect. And this doesn't just apply to grammar, uh, of course. Pronunciation is another one. Uh, you have uh, a wide variety of pronunciations in most languages, often the case, not always. And there is usually one that's based on uh, socioeconomic status that's regarded as more prestigious than others. For many, many years in the United Kingdom, the so-called received pronunciation, which is uh, uh, sort of an official term for Queen's English, if you will, was the uh, chosen standard. But in time, this is uh, really disintegrated. Oh, very, very, very few people speak uh, RP as, as we refer to it, received pronunciation. Uh, those of you, most of you are, of course, fans and, and, and acolytes of, of Gopher. Uh, he most certainly does not have an RP accent. Uh, in fact, uh, it's very clear that specifically what his accent is, but it's not RP. And most people uh, don't have that either. Uh, in, in my city of origin, for example, New York City, uh, this has disappeared over the years, but there's still a distinction between socioeconomic class often in that uh, many British varieties and certain mm, sociolects of New York English uh, are not what we say non-rhotic. That is to say, in intervocalic positions between vowels, the R won't be pronounced. So many people, uh, my parents' generation, would, would not say something like uh, York, rather, but York, York, or as but turkey, turkey, or things like that. Uh, pork, pork. And um, once again, but there was an extensive study in the 1970s by a socio, very, very famous sociolinguist named, uh, by the name of William LeBov, and he did a very extensive uh, investigation of uh, these uh, socioelectrical varieties and how uh, clearly the, the socioeconomic uh, status of the speaker and the association of that socioeconomic status with, uh, with a particular pronunciation, these were the main... That was the main determinant of uh, so-called proper speech, or what people regarded as proper speech, in terms of pronunciation. Uh, now, mass media, which is very, has in the past, radio and television have, have served to smooth out these diff uh, differences very often. Uh, certainly mass media and in the sense of television and radio in the past have served to, to, to further standards and pronunciation. Few people of my generation, I don't have a New York, New York accent whatsoever, but few people, but that's because I have I, many reasons. I've, I've been an English teacher in the past. I've lived in myriad countries. I, I simply don't have it. But even if you were to take a, uh, a lifer, if you will, someone who spent most of his life in New York City, from my generation onwards, uh, the likelihood that he or she would have a, a non-rhotic accent, depending on the, the socioeconomic background, uh, but even less depending on that these days, it's just not there. I mean, that's what mass communication via radio and television have done. However, what's quite interesting with regards to the Internet, which I guess you could regard as the, the ultimate form of mass communication, 
uh, it is the mass communication of the future, is that quite the opposite, uh, opposite effect of what we've seen uh, regarding uh, radio and television in the 20th century has been the case with the internet. Um, the internet, where virtually everyone is a participant in, and where people write things sort of willy-nilly, uh, seems to serve the rather the dissolution of standards rather than the consolidation of standards, which uh, which is somewhat seems paradoxical and yet is not. Remember, radio and television um, usually had were presented and, and offered to the public in an official capacity. That is to say that these uh, means of communication, these media, uh, stem or had stemmed from uh, from official channels, government. And, and by official, of, of course, I mean the channels that would offer prescriptive standards for language. Uh, the BBC, perfect example. The BBC is publicly funded and uh, presumably you know, those of socioeconomic status uh, were at least originally the primary donors, uh, although that's changed over the years. And, and, and likewise, uh, even if it's just, even if these institutions are private, very often they have the government's ear. So, um, you know, mass, me, mass television media in the United States, for, for example, you all know the reporter voice, right? Uh, the reporter voice, which is universal in American English, which uh, you know, no one speaks that way unless they actually try to speak this way, the way I'm speaking now. No one speaks this way. Well, right, I mean, that, that's the reporter voice. You're probably familiar with that. Um, once again, official channels. What's interesting, what, what, what's not paradoxical about the Internet, if you actually examine the contents, is that the Internet is, is willy-nilly. There, there's, there's no real center of control there. And thus people are going to express themselves linguistically as, as they're accustomed to. There's, there's no regulation. And that's why you see the variety, uh, the non-standard uh, variety uh, that you do, and particularly the descriptive variety that you do. In any given uh, comment section on a YouTube video, in, in English at least, and as well as other languages, you'll see uh, a whole slew of non-standard, not descriptive uh, models of, of language. And that's because there's just no regulation of that. However, in spite of all of that, I, I do feel that prescriptive standards have serve a use or serve some utilitarian purpose. Me being so out of the loop as I am uh, or have been for many years, I don't know what the standards are these days in, uh, in the United States. But I, I do know that far more so in the current generation than my generation, there's a lot of confusion as to the differentiation between prescriptive standards and descriptive standards in American English. Uh, when I think about, for example, the distinctions that I had to learn, and then again, my background, of course, is very differentiated. I mean, I've studied Latin and ancient Greek and all these, uh, clearly have a different perspective on these things. But even in school, from what I can dimly recollect from those times, uh, there was not... Uh, I mean, we, we, there was certainly a distinction, and one was at least intuitively aware of the distinction. But I think things have gone topsy-turvy in a large sense, and whether or not this is ultimately destructive or not is kind of irrelevant. Like I said, descriptivism always wins. That's the way, because people speak as they're accustomed to. People, I think, in my observation, are letting uh, more and more of descriptive use uh, sort of blend or, or bleed over into the uh, prescriptive use uh, that many people can't distinguish between the two. Uh, I don't think there are many people left in my observation that even bother distinguishing say the existential construction there is there are. So just as an example in 50 years time I suspect there's there's as opposed to there is there are will become a standard universally even in written uh, written uh, written sp uh, speech uh, and official discourse. Uh, and uh, this is just the trend. But 
you know, the other thing, another thing, uh, to whom it may concern, this is a very official, sounds very official, so people will often use it incorrectly even because they don't understand the function of whom, which is more or less has died out. I mean, virtually no one, no one uses uh, whom anymore. Uh, and if they do, it's very, or if people do, uh, it's very often, well, they don't understand that it's an object, and so it's gone out the window. I suspect that whom in a hundred years time maybe will be completely gone from the English language, just an archaic relic. So if I have any concerns, which I don't really regarding these trends, is that uh, prescriptive standards have a utilitarian function, but there's a, a there are varying degrees of bleed over. There's, there you go, there are very as opposed there. A bleed over from descriptive models of, of speech into the prescriptive realm, and uh, I think the distinction is handy to keep in uh, to bear in mind. Now, mind you, this is nothing unique to English. Every language has this uh, French, uh, be it pronunciation or otherwise, or grammar. French, German, Turkish, Korean, uh, Danish. Uh, this is. Uh, this is a universal and the contention that you know one form of variety uh, or variety of a language is better than the other is also kind of a universal people have been claiming this it's almost always based on socioeconomic uh, status yeah, for example in in South Korea the the denizens of Seoul look down upon the the, the southern denizens uh, because of their speech patterns because well it doesn't conform to What's regarded as the national standard, which originated in Seoul as the uh, the capital city, and uh, so this is just how uh, how that works. But you know, it doesn't really matter what I think or what you think or anyone thinks, because language will change as it changes, and people will speak it as it as they speak. Uh, and I think at some point in time, in a few decades, if I'm still alive, uh, my speech will become essentially fossilized the manner in which I speak because I, I just this is that that's my background as I get older I move away from contemporary speech uh, and I'm not I'm not in an I don't live in an anglo-saxon environment anymore so uh, it sort of becomes fossilized in a way anyway I just wanted to give a brief overview of uh, descriptivism uh, versus prescriptivism and uh, you know as, as a sort of a side uh, a side issue um, because there are so many issues and topics in language and linguistics can't possibly cover them all but uh, this is of course another topic um, unrelated but related somehow to the historical stuff I've been doing so I hope you enjoyed that and uh, everyone take care